you, you can't rush these things. You can't rush creativity. You can't rush, you know, music making and art and whatnot. Um, you have to take care of yourself first and foremost. Um, you know, the, the time will come when, you know, you think that you're ready to get back into it, um, to get back into that sense of creativity, to get back into it, whether it's composing or arranging or writing or even, you know, painting or drawing and, and whatnot. Um, but I guess the best thing I can say is, you know, take care of yourself first because you need to. It's more important than, than anything else, now more than ever. Have you ever wondered what's behind the music of your favorite composer? Where does their inspiration come from? What do they stand for? What are they most passionate about? What's behind the name at the top of the page? My name is Jeff Herwig. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I'm going to bring you the answers to those questions and more. Welcome to Composer Disclosure. Hello friends, welcome to Season 1, Episode 1, the first and hopefully not the last episode of Composer Disclosure. Today it is my distinct pleasure to share with you my discussion with composer and good friend Josh Trentadu. In our conversation, Josh and I cover quite a few topics ranging from his earliest inspirations to compose, his favorite music notation software, how he helped co-found the Millennium Composers Initiative, and some insight into his first symphony. Let's get right to it. Josh, it's great to be able to speak with you, and thank you so much for joining me for episode number one. Hopefully, there's an episode number two. How's everything going? Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. Really an honor to be a part of your podcast. I'm uh, I'm hanging in there, you know, for the most part, all things considered. So nice. Thanks for asking. It's an honor to have you here. Since this is episode number one, I'd like to sort of lay out the form of the show, if you will. The first part of each episode is going to be dedicated to getting to know each of our individual guests. I'll lay out the standard questions that you hear on most podcasts to give you, the listeners, a better understanding of our composers' backgrounds and their interests. All right, Josh, let's get right to it here. If you can remember, what was your earliest inspiration to compose? I would have to say that that particular instance occurred during uh, an early year of high school for me. At some point, uh, it just clicked. At some point, it just clicked that this is what I wanted to do with my life. This is what I wanted to do with my career. And I think part of that was because in high school, I was a part of the band program there. And being a part of that program, I was exposed to a lot of composers' music that I hadn't heard of before, but that I know pretty well now. For example, the music of John Mackey and David Veselanka mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, that taught me the idea that, oh yeah, these are human beings and human <laughs> beings can actually do this. So why can't I or something like that? But on a deeper level than that, it also um, really just showed that we are so capable of creating such beautiful artwork and and whatnot and that was something that i knew that i wanted to do i suppose if i could just do something like this and also connect with people on a different level than just you know talking to somebody or whatnot i thought that might be a, a good thing nice it, were there for me personally there were like two different moments where like i was first inspired to like create music and then later on it was like i can like do this for a career and I'd be happy doing that. Was Were there like two different instances for you? Yeah, I think um, for, for an instance like that, I think the first time I, you know, had that kind of thought or that kind of experience was when I started composing really in college, when I started um, going to college for a composition degree and I started coming out of my shell a little bit, so to mm -hmm. speak, in terms of writing music. Because the first couple of pieces that you write, you know, it's, going to always be something you look back on and think well this is definitely where i was at where i started but i don't think i necessarily want to be there now you know and maybe that's true of like 
you know, every step of your career, you always want to try and do something different. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the first time I ever felt something like that was the first time I really shared music with other people who were actually excited about what I was doing and wanted to perform this and play this. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the greatest and most beneficial part of, of this path of this, uh, idea of being composer is collaborating with people who invest in this, in what you're doing as much as you're investing your own time in it and so on and so forth. Right. Very cool. Um, and I guess you kind of alluded to this a little bit. Um, are there any composers that you would say really influence your writing? Um, like, is there, are there any composers that you would say have such a great impact on you that they're sort of part of your musical DNA when you're writing? Well, I did mention before John Mackey and David Maslanka. Absolutely. John, because one of the first pieces of his that I ever listened to was Asphalt Cocktail. And that for me was sort of a moment in my life where it kicked me back onto mm -hmm. the musical track because in middle school and whatnot, I was playing music in bands that I didn't necessarily think was really interesting to me. In fact, for some time, leading up to high school, I just wanted to quit music altogether because I wasn't really getting anything interesting out of mm -hmm. it. I, I mean, I took instrumental lessons. I was pl learning piano. I was playing Mozart. I was playing a little bit of jazz, which I liked back then, but I didn't really get to start appreciating until high school and now much later on in my life and so mm -hmm. on. But uh, when I started band in high school and asphalt cocktail was one of the first pieces that we played that sort of kickstarted it for me because it's fun because mm -hmm. it's exciting it's engaging and it's also me as like a teenager in a heavy metal music mode and suddenly we get this piece <laughs> of band that basically lets you rock and roll right i mean i'm a percussionist too <laughs> how could you not like that you know so yeah. <laughs> it was that um Mezlika because i mean what can be said about him that hasn't already been said his music was powerful it's incredible it's epic it is emotional it is everything you want it to be uh, from a performing or from a performer's perspective from a listening perspective and it's also music that he's written that can be used to heal in a way like it, parts of his seventh symphony and even his third symphony come to mind mm -hmm. for that reason um apart from that growing up at least um i was always fascinated by the music of john Williams, and that really inspired me to start you know writing music for film and television and whatnot um john curliano was another composer whose music i was exposed to in high school circus maximus comes to mind mm -hmm. i remember just watching michigan state's wind symphony perform that in 2010 and just being awe inspired by all these incredible things that you could do with with an ensemble like just place players all in the concert hall because <laughs> why not just get an actual surround sound level why not just have a shotgun at the end of the piece you know to really dramatize um the impact the social and political impact of your work why not mm. just have a marching band go through you know stuff like that <laughs> and uh i think about that every now and again with the symphony i'm writing which has this large ensemble and this jazz combo that's at odds with them with the solo flutist that's at, mm -hmm. you know trying to keep the peace so to speak but um that that was at least growing up but now it's i'm inspired by a multitude of artists everything from band and orchestra to jazz to hip-hop to um even indie music mm -hmm. and whatnot video game music film music you know there's a whole slew of composers too like Omar Thomas and Kevin Day and Julie Giroux, John Pajali, Viet Quang, and so mm -hmm. on. So nice. I, I had a very similar um, introduction to John Mackey's music. Um, when I first moved into college, my my college roommate, my freshman year, was a trombone major, and he um uh, and we we were getting yeah. to know each other, and he That's showed it. me the concerto for trombone. I was That's like, it right there. I was like, this is band music. <laughs> you can do this. Uh, that that. After that, I just developed a composer crush on on John Mackey from that moment on. So <laughs> I mean, honestly, the moment you hear his music, especially as as a high schooler, and you have a band director who's like really supportive of his music, and you play it, how could you not honestly? It how could you not honestly love his music? You know, right. it's engaging, but it can also be so emotional and soulful. Mm -hmm. Like ugh, the Frozen Cathedral still gets me to this day oh, yeah. because of its because of what the piece was based about. And I say the same thing with like much of John's later music too. 
you know, yeah. the places we can no longer go, for example, that is gut wrenching mm-hmm. for me. You know, uh, I know that you wa- write for like a super wide variety of ensembles, um, you know, anywhere from orchestra to band to chamber ensembles. Um, do you have a favorite medium to write for, one that you look forward to, uh, you know, writing for the most? To be honest with you, um, I don't think I necessarily do. And the only reason I say that is because I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been very fortunate to have the experiences that I've had in writing for the band and orchestra, but also starting out, I wrote a lot of chamber music because that was an opportunity for me, like I said earlier, to be able to collaborate with performers and friends and colleagues that were really excited about, you know, the music that I was writing and wanted to perform it and wanted to, you know, collaborate with me and stuff like that. So I started out with a lot of that. Um, Film, television, video game music, and so on and so forth. That's a different thing altogether because what you're seeing now with especially film scores and TV and whatnot is this idea of quote unquote hybrid scoring, where you're not just really using acoustic instruments. You're also using electronic instruments. You're using synthesizers. You're using uh, samples that might be with your digital audio workstation or samples that you even create yourselves or using uh, uh, an organ that you just finished remodeling like Nathan Barr recently did, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, stuff like that. And that's what really intrigued me about film music is, you know, the palette is different, but you're still composing with your own artistic intent, so long as you know you're satisfying the needs of your director or your producer, your collaborators, and so on and so forth. So um, to answer your question, really, do I have any preferences on what medium of music I like to write for? I mean, I do like large ensemble music. I do like writing for jazz with the little bit of experience that I've had writing for jazz now. But I think more to the point, I just really like the collaborative process. I just really like working with the artists that I've been so lucky and fortunate to work with. And at that point, you know, the medium comes later for me in that respect because uh, it's all about the collaboration for me, I guess. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, that does. Okay, this next one is hit or miss with some people. Um, do you have a consistent writing process or are you the kind of person that it varies based on the project? Man, my writing process is not consistent at all. <laughs> it is not. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me do a, let me do a comparison at least. So <laughs> to, to give an idea, um, last year, Jordan Van Hemer, who um, is the current saxophone and jazz professor at Hope College commissioned me to write a soprano saxophone concerto for him called Summertime Echoes. We talked about it. We had a fantastic collaborative process putting this piece together and we put it together a consortium for it and whatnot. But when I wrote the piece, I had this planned out, all three movements, and we were talk- going back and forth, Jordan and I, talking about it constantly just to make sure that this is exactly what we both wanted it to be. Because I wasn't writing this piece from, you know, just as a large ensemble piece. It's a concerto. You also are writing this for a soloist, right? So he and I had a very intensive collaborative process that I think was you know, extremely beneficial for me, but all of it was planned out. Like I had a very concrete idea of where I wanted this piece to go and Jordan did too. And we deliberated on that. All the ideas were basically written down. I had some thematic motivic stuff that I had planned out and everything. So um, that's how really that came to be. Now the symphony I'm writing, I had that all planned out, obviously with all of that in mind. Um, But there's, more elements at play here than Summertime Echoes because there's so many more guest artists involved. We have a concrete idea for this. I have musical material that's explicitly planned out, written down, sketched out, so on and so forth. But a lot of this piece is driven purely by gut emotion and instinct. So a lot of the, uh, I guess the form of each of the five movements that this is gonna be, a lot of that structurally speaking, is, you know, coming together based on that pure 
emotional instinct and whatnot because uh, because the symphony is talking about these issues that are plaguing our society and our planet it's talking about how the pandemic has exacerbated all of them so to speak and uh you know how i'm feeling about all of this going on how each of the seven guest artists i'm working with are feeling about all of this and so on and like the jazz cabo members for example they're making a platform an improvised solo where each of them is going to talk about these issues that they've chosen to talk about for this piece and to that extent, um, the, the transition, so to speak, for each of these movements aren't really planned out. Um, it's, it's, like I said, driven by that pure emotional instinct. So the writing process for this has been very, very different because there's so much more at play here and there's so much more um, coming together, I guess. And I haven't even talked about uh, the the other elements of this, what the solo Plutus is doing and all of that. And she and I have been, you know, collaborating on that, really bringing that to life in that respect. And yeah, I guess, I guess if I have to say it, it does wildly vary from piece to piece, either it's, you have this planned out, you have a great idea of what you're going to do. That's it. Here are all the notes. Oh, I love this chord. That's it. It's all there. Or you have a, a process where it's just like, you know, I have all of this stuff written out, but I just want to throw myself into all of this and just see where it takes me. And I feel like this symphony has very much thrown me in that process so far. Nice. Yeah, I'm very, very similar. Um, it depends on, on the individual project, but if somebody gives me a specific thing that they want the the piece to be about, like a specific theme or something, that's so much easier for me to just sketch it out right away and jump into it but if they give me like a blank slate it's just uh such a slower process like thinking like is this what they wanted is it, like i prefer to have a much more specific outline ahead of time from the person that i'm collaborating with versus them being like oh do you know whatever you want i like this one thing you did one time and it's like i can't yeah i can definitely <laughs> agree with that I, I i definitely agree with that because um regardless of what the project is like you said i'd like to have a little certainty mm -hmm. with with my own commissions too so if you know i'm presented with a situation that said write something for this i know you're going to do well with it go for it um it sort of raises the stakes for the the commission so to speak because you have this draft or something and you're not sure if you you particularly like it or something like that because i don't know you've been hearing it 20 or 30 times at the playback right so I mean, there is always there is always that that sort of situation that happens, and I've certainly experienced that too. But I think that's why I like the collaborative process more too, because then once you when I have those sketches or those drafts, I usually just talk to my performers as much as possible. I send that stuff out, and, and you know, I just ask them questions like, "Hey, is this sort of what you're looking for? What do you think of this? Play this for me. I don't mm -hmm. know. Is it trash? I'll dump it, but you know, <laughs> yeah, oh. nothing like that." Well, the next question is kind of tied in, into that. And uh, for those of you in the future, um, this is being recorded in September of 2020 in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, Yay, good <laughs> stuff. No, back, I'm kidding. <laughs> back in March, uh, March 12th to be exact, is when our schools closed down uh, here in Pennsylvania. And from that day on, uh, I had to finish teaching the school year, attempting to teach online while also having to like watch my two children that were under three years old at the same time. And it was disastrous and it completely threw me off of everything like daily schedule and all that stuff. I could not write anything that was good. And to the point where I just kind of gave up on writing for a little bit um, until recently, I kind of came out of that funk. Um, but it was really difficult for me to be creative at all during that whole time. And I'm not sure if something similar happened to you, Josh, but um I know that you have been writing throughout this whole time. What are your tips to being creative during this this crazy time when our lives changed in a matter of of hours? Man, that's a tough question. Um, I honestly think the first thing that I want to say is um, that it's completely okay, first and foremost, not to be creative during this because your personal health and your well-being and taking care of yourself is way, way more important, you know, than anything else. That means you find, you know, your outlet through creativity, like I somehow did throughout much of this, then great, go for it. If that means you take some time for yourself, don't write for a while, um, 
and take care of yourself. Yeah, that's that's important too. Um, you you can't rush these things. You can't rush creativity. You can't rush you know music making and art and whatnot. Um, you have to take care of yourself first and foremost. Um, you know the the time will come when you know you think that you're ready to get back into it. Um, to get back into that sense of creativity, to get back into it, whether it's composing or arranging or writing or even, you know, painting or drawing and, and whatnot. Um, but I guess the best thing I can say is, you know, take care of yourself first because you need to. It's more important than, than anything else now more than ever. switching gears here a little bit and i know your answer to this but i'm going to ask every guest this question just so our listeners however many there may be just get a a good idea of what uh you know some of their favorite composers use to write so uh notation software ah that's stickler are you a sibelius person a finale person a dorico person a note flight whatever it may be and why you trying to start a notation software war (laughs) is that what's going on yep I see the finale people in the back. They get ready. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> nah, all right. I'll get inside. Uh, I want to stress before I answer this, and I will answer this as to why I personally like this, mm-hmm. but whatever notation software you use, if that works best for you, use it. You know, I have um, I have learned all three of the big ones at this point, Sibelius, Finale, and Dorico. I would like to think that I know them relatively well, even though I have preferences on what I actually use for, for my career and whatnot. Mm-hmm. All of them are great in their own way. Finale is extremely powerful. Sibelius is still intuitive in its own way. And why I like Dorico so much, which is the one that I use, is it is the first software that I have used that has allowed me to be able to express my creative freedom in a way that I never really got from Sibelius and Finale. And a lot of that was because with Sibelius and Finale, I always felt I was limited by the software I was using, whether it was a glitch, technical stuff, or so many different back-end coding or framework or technology, if you will, to make something look, uh, you know, presentable on the page and understandable for the performers and whatnot. And I don't use that much special, you know, kind of notation. I'm only just starting to really get into that. But with Dorico, it has given me more of that sense of creative freedom that I now feel like I'm able to, you know, do some of those things uh, more often. Like for example, I just finished a piece for adaptable ensemble um, that is actually for the most part cell music, which I know you can do very effectively in Sibelius and Finale, but uh, with Dorico, I felt most comfortable writing cell music for the first time because I found a way to be able to do that. And let me stress too, that Dorico has its own issues. You know, it's, Every notation software has their own issues, and I wouldn't say necessarily that Dorico is there yet, but it has significantly progressed in the last year and a half to a point where I just absolutely love it, and I love the features that it has, and it's honestly worth, you know, um, the issues that, you know, it has. Um, But that being said, as I mentioned before, whatever notation software you end up using, If it's your personal preference and it works well for you and you really love it and you do well with it, then use it. You know, I started out on MuseScore in high school and look how far (laughs) MuseScore has come in in, since then. I'm still amazed by it with 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 uh, how far it's progressed. So, you know, to each their own. I still have a few MuseScore files saved on an old laptop of very bad marching band arrangements. And I, I don't know why I can't part with them, but they still exist. <laughs> you know, I do too. Um, way, way back when, when I was just experimenting with, with MuseScore, I wrote this um, suite for band that was very heavily inspired by jazz, because why not? And, you know, for, I, I think I still have it somewhere on an old computer. I may have to go back to that, actually, because it's a little... It's a little weird that I'm doing this simply now that has all this jazz and whatnot, mm-hmm. you know, picking up that now, <laughs> man. Yeah. And I need to stress that neither Josh nor I are endorsed by any music notation software, but if anybody does want to endorse either of us 
or myself, I'll speak for myself. I will gladly take your endorsement. Okay, moving on. Uh, my last uh, question for this first portion of the show here. Um, it, your bio mentions that you are a founding member and a current board member of the Millennium Composers Initiative. Um, and, and those of you that don't know, I'm also, I'm a proud member of MCI. Um, but for those that don't know what MCI is, could you elaborate a little bit, you know, how it was started and, you know, what its mission is and where it's gone since its first inception? Yeah, absolutely. So back in 2018, um, a good friend of mine, Duncan Peterson Jones and I decided that we wanted to start a composer initiative because, uh, for personal reasons, first and foremost, um, I at least wasn't feeling very connected with other artists um, on a, say, let's say a national level. Um, I had just started school at NYU and I was very, very focused on my graduate studies and it didn't really feel like I was focused on anything else. But um, Duncan and I wanted to start this initiative to connect with other composers. And the more that we talked about the idea of maybe doing something to represent, you know, other composers, the more it became clear that we really wanted to start an initiative that was going to support young composers like us at the beginning of our professional careers, regardless of your background, what you, the music that you write, your identity, um, and so on and so forth. So, MCI really has uh, progressed with that, I would think. We're a group of almost 40 members at the time this podcast is being recorded. And uh, our mission is basically to do just that, represent young composers at the beginning of their professional careers. And our members have written everything from film and TV music to band and orchestra, to jazz, to chamber music, to experimental music, to jazz music and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And one of the things that we strive to do as an initiative is to also be able to try and provide composers the ability to be able to connect with other artists and, and collaborate with them and see where that goes and so on and so forth. So we have done collaborative concerts with some pretty fantastic chamber groups in the past, uh, including the Zine, the Saxophone Quartet, the Blank Experiment, who just put out an album, uh, and the Holland Concert Jazz Orchestra and Front Porch Ensemble, to, to name a few. And we also try to represent our composers on a, uh, on a conference level as well. We have appeared at the Midwest Clinic Conference a couple of times to represent our composers' works. And that's really where we've gone at this point. We are putting together some more collaborative concerts that are going to be coming up soon. Uh, we've been set back a little bit because of the pandemic, because of mm -hmm. everything else going on. So we've been going through a massive restructuring process uh, as far as what our projects are going to entail. But we have some really exciting stuff coming up pretty soon. And and I just want to add, um, you know, as a member of MCI, in a in a career as uh, competitive as composition, uh, it's such a great community of people that support one another within our field. To see everybody, you know, celebrating each other's successes. And it's really inspiring to someone like me that jumped into composition super late and to be able to like, you know, collaborate and just to talk to people like you and Kevin Day and yeah. Harrison Collins. And like yeah. those of you that are way more experienced than me, it, it's just that it was a game changer for me to be able to, to get those experiences with you guys. So yeah, I agree with that. And I just want to add to that. That is what I've loved about um, MCI the most and seeing how far it's come is that sense of community that's been built between all of us really um, it's given me opportunities that I thought I would have never experienced you know in the past couple of years and the chance to be able to collaborate with some phenomenal artists and performers and I think more so I've made new friends from this group as a result of this too um, and that's just been really wonderful for me especially because as of right now i'm not i'm living in a in a place that's not that doesn't have as big of a music scene as say new york city or nashville or or los angeles if you will i'm in a pretty quiet location right now so it's been nice to have that connection with other composers you know in the country and around the world
Now, uh, Josh, I know one of the, the things you wanted to talk about today was um, the, the idea of combining different genres or influences within a single musical composition. Um, and I know that you're, you've already referenced this earlier in our uh, interview here, but um, you're currently applying this idea to your first symphony. So I have two quick questions for you. Uh, the first one uh, is just where did the idea of trying to combine these different things come from? Was it just something that, you know, came to you or did you witness something that inspired you to do this? And secondly, elaborate for us on what your project is, because it's a lot more than just a piece of music. It's this giant, huge, unique collaborative effort that is like an interdisciplinary work that's more than just a musical piece of art. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think my answer for this is kind of going to go hand in hand with both of these together. Awesome. But um, growing up, I had a number of, I would say, musical influences um, based on what I was listening to, based on the music that I was playing in band, and so on and so forth. Um, so classic rock and heavy rock, or heavy metal and prog rock, for example, were a huge influence on what I was listening to. Mm -hmm. I love Dream Theater's music, for example. I love Pink Floyd, love the Beatles and whatnot. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was really inspired by John Williams' his film music and later his concert music, which he has a fantastic volume of concert music and, and whatnot. That really inspired me on a different level. So that was really where most of my um, classical and orchestral you know, influence sort of came from. And obviously I've been influenced by the band composers um, from, from high school and, and onwards and whatnot. Uh, and, you know, the other music I was listening to. So this, um, this plethora of, you know, these different genres and styles that I was listening to, I would say it in some weird way influenced me uh, and my compositional career because it, I guess it sort of gave me this artistic freedom to not limit myself to one specific type of music. Um, for example, I've written a chamber piece for bass saxophone and bass clarinet that is extremely, you know, experimental, but it grooves every now and again. But I've also written music for middle school and high school concert bands that are really tonal and accessible in a way, but also, you know, tries to be as creatively engaging as possible. And I think that's the big thing I want to stress is I want it to be as creatively engaging as possible. So, um, starting out really those influences came in with i don't know having a massive percussion section just rocking and rolling in the back or just having um the the idea of a band piece that has themes and motives driving it that sounds a little filmic that sounds like oh uh, we are immersing ourselves in this in this you know place that the composer is thinking of or i guess this idea or this emotion or something and whatnot and i think what's really been inspiring me lately with my recent work is the idea of maybe writing for a concept or an idea or an emotion but maybe not necessarily for a specific thing at first so the blending of genres um uh as i mentioned really gave me the inspiration to not limit myself to one particular style of music i like the the thought of writing for different contexts, um, different ideas and, and whatnot. Like my early music, for example, was, was very, very dissonant and my music still is to an extent, but um, I don't know, I guess I've just grown up really. Um, I've just been doing this for so many years that my mm -hmm. own aesthetic has been changing in its own way. And maybe that's just because I'm changing as, as a, still as a young adult, but getting close to my thirties or something like that. And with everything going on, who knows? And this idea of blending genres together I, definitely does come into play with this symphony. As you mentioned, it is interdisciplinary. It's also multimedia. It's, um, or for those of you listening to this that don't know about the project, um, this is being written for poetry and there's gonna be some poets I'm collaborating with um, and that I'm still getting together by the time this podcast is recording and I should hopefully have more news about that soon. Um, there's fixed media electronics at play where it's not just going to be, you know, quote unquote sound design music, if you will, to enhance what's going on. It's also going to be um, interviews that we would like to conduct of our greater music community, um, talking about the very issues that are going to be talked about in the piece. So if you'd like to talk about any of these issues in the piece and you want to be interviewed for that, um, 
let me know. We'd like to, we'd like to have you on board for this. Um, there's a jazz combo, as was mentioned. It's six people. This is a very progressive jazz combo in the style of post bop that is going to be talking about these issues. Each of the members have chosen an issue for the piece. There's a solo flutist who is, as I said earlier, trying to you know keep the peace between the large ensemble and the jazz combo. And they're going to bring a perspective to this that essentially, you know, verges on music therapy, so to speak. There's this sound healing element that I'm only really just starting to learn. Um, Amy knows much, much more about that and is going to bring that to the table with this and it's going to be used in the piece. And finally, just the large ensemble and whatnot. So all of this is coming together to basically talk about um, many of the issues that are tearing us apart as a society and uh, tearing apart the planet, how the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated all of this, and in some ways, even social media too, because social media has been doing this exponentially, especially in the past decade or so. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, just how I and all of the guest artists that I'm collaborating with are feeling about all of this. Um, I mean, I was just having a conversation about this earlier with somebody today. Um, by the, the time that this podcast is being recorded, I had basically been transparent on social media about the fact that this piece is going to be so dark and violent and brutal and whatnot. And, um, Somebody mentioned, I think it was Omar Thomas, actually, uh, catharsis, as if we were, you know, doing this mm -hmm. for catharsis. And I absolutely agree with that. But I think I think the question that this piece is going to ask more than anything else is, where do we go from here? To tell you the truth, I don't even know if it's going to be answered in this piece. And I would feel better to tell you the truth if it wasn't, because that's something we have to discover for ourselves is where do we go from here? So... To that effect, um, to again, to answer your question, you have post-bop jazz versus traditional and yet also classical contemporary large ensemble music. You have a sort of a mixture of that with this solo flute part for Amy, but you also have music therapy involved, a specific kind of meditation called sound healing involved that is, you know, going to bring something different to this and dare I say even spiritual to this. And then you have also all of these other interdisciplinary elements, you know, adding to this and hopefully enhancing it in a way that, you know, makes it understandable or at least adds to the gravitas of the piece, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Do you want to give a little background on the, the uh, guest artists? Yeah, absolutely. I can give a little background on who I'm collaborating with. So in the jazz combo, um, I am so lucky to be working with Jordan Van Hemert again. Uh, he's playing tanner saxophone for this. And Kevin Day is actually playing in the jazz combo too. He's a pretty fantastic jazz pianist. Um, if, uh, and also a brilliant composer, but he's also a wonderful, equally wonderful jazz pianist. So um, I'm so excited to be writing for him too. He's, he's phenomenal. If you, if you haven't heard him play jazz piano, seriously, go listen and play jazz piano. It's, I can confirm he's fantastic. <laughs> oh, it's incredible. Like, I just remember um, seeing him play at uh, Midwest Clinic Conference one year. I think it was at the Chicago Hilton. He just he just goes and jams with the jazz group and just he just plays like it's yep. nothing. And I'm just and everyone's just sitting there like, what? What? Oh, my God. It's great. Um, So both of them are wonderful. And with their jazz backgrounds, they're bringing a lot into this. Uh, we have a flute player in the jazz combo that I know from high school, Emily Dierichs. She just graduated with her doctorate from the Frost School of Music. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal performer. I'm so excited to be working with her. Uh, Lily Christie is a friend of Kevin Day's. We met through this project, and she is currently um, she is currently working as a trumpet player in New Orleans, and she's been absolutely wonderful to collaborate with throughout throughout this. Um, Amanda Rutza is currently based in New York City and is a bit our bass guitarist for the jazz combo. She is just incredible, uh, just absolutely incredible. And uh, as with everybody else, so excited to be working with her and our drum player as well. Our drum set player is Kevin Keith, who I know from college. Um, he went to Michigan State for a couple of years while I was there and whatnot. So this is a very eclectic group, I would say, but 
all of these people are just fantastic artists, fantastic human beings. They all have something to say and they're gonna make their voices heard. And the level of commitment that is brought to this, this symphony has been absolutely wonderful. So that's the jazz combo. Our solo flutist is Amy Rosendahl and I also know her from high school. Um, she's currently based out in New Mexico and just finished her master's degree. She's a professional flutist. She's a music therapist and she's a certified sound healing practitioner. With, hence why the sound healing element is going to be brought into the symphony as well. And we've had a absolutely wonderful collaboration too on this. And, you know, I'm so excited that she's involved with this project as well as, as much as everybody else in the jazz combo. So, mm -hmm. And that, that aspect of, of this project really um, is awesome to me and my family. My wife is a, a music therapist as well. Um, oh, when I told great. Yeah, when I when I told her about this, she's like, "That is so cool." Um, and that's actually the, the next question that I had for you. Um, if you could elaborate, I know that you're that um, Amy is the specialist in this area, but could you elaborate a little bit on what exactly you know sound healing is? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, you know, Amy's more of the expert on this, so I'm actually going to read to you what she wrote for this project because I think okay. that explains it better than you know honestly anything else I could say. And this is this quote is on the, our website for the symphony too. She says, and I quote, sound healing is a safe and effective form of holistic healing that uses resonant vibrations to address physical, emotional, cognitive, and social needs of individuals. Sound can be used in a therapeutic relationship to restore harmony and balance to the body, mind, and spirit, reducing physical tension and stress while boosting our immune system. It can also help to clear any energetic blockages while stimulating positive spiritual growth and transformation. So for me as a composer, at least two things, you know, you know spoke to me immediately when we first talked about this one using music to, to heal on a spiritual level and on a therapeutic level, which is fantastic. And um, this was a practice I had never even heard of before until this project. And the, the whole thing just continues to fascinate me. Um, and the second thing was really the idea that this sandbox has now opened to be able to use music in this way as a means to heal. And the question that I've really been going back and forth with the symphony is, how on earth is that going to be integrated? And um, Amy and I have been talking a lot about that. And I've been exploring that as much as possible, you know, with this piece. But um, it's it's going to be worked into this. It's really that key element that's going to bring all of this together. Because I think in the end, the piece is going to present some idea on a musical level of how music can be used to heal or, you know, how you can get two very opposing groups to start listening to each other, whatever that may be on a symbolic level or what have you. But uh, as, you know, as far as that element goes, she has a set of singing bowls that are gonna be used, which is pretty common for, um, for, for sound healing, if I'm not mistaken. And that's gonna be integrated into the piece and, and so on. So, you know, she's not just playing flute for this. I'm not just writing all this crazy flute music for her. She's also, you know, gonna be a sound healer literally on the concert stage and, you know, create this session that I'm basically giving her free reign to do. I'm stepping out of the way so that she can do that. I think that I'm looking forward to seeing as much as I'm looking forward to seeing the improv that all the jazz combo members are going to do. Cause I'm stepping out of the way for that too. I can't speak on any of these issues that they're going to talk about. That's, you know, that's their contribution. I'm just, you know, creating the, metaphorical conflict so to speak between you know all of these musicians on stage um, right and, and you know that um that's kind of a, a tricky question for you know uh, people like you and and i um yeah. try, uh, for those of you uh, i guess you can't see us we are both white men <laughs> yes it's, um it's kind of you know a tricky situation trying to create art about the time we're living in right now and we are coming from a position of of privilege um how have you how have you yes. sort of um, dealt with that and how are you, you know, writing from your perspective, um, you know, as you're writing this piece about all of this social, um, injustices and various things that are going on in our country. Yeah, absolutely. So when this project first came to be, and I had thought of the idea of, you know, blending these two genres together, having jazz and contemporary classical music, whatever you want to call it at odds with each other. 
that was the first thought I had for it. When I started talking to, you know, the people that I wanted to collaborate with, when we, you know, when a combo started forming, that was when it became clear that all of us, you know, really had something to say about the state of the world of everything going on. And so with each of the jazz combo members, for example, coming up with this issue that is very, you know, very uh, relevant in our society today that's going on and that is you know, something we need to confront and address, like racial discrimination, for example, or the fact that social media is ter literally tearing our society apart because it's technology that's not being used as a tool, it's being used for more harm than good, or, you know, and, and what have you, or even gender discrimination, because that is still a prevailing issue today, and it's horrible, it's absolutely horrible. You know, when it became clear that the jazz combo members wanted to talk about these things. I felt that it was important to address because we were at a point that we felt it was necessary for this piece to begin addressing what was going on in the world. And when it got to that point, our collaborative process, I realized, you know, as you just talked about, as we just talked about, uh, I can't talk about any of these things. I'm a straight cisgender white male. I, I do have a position of privilege and, you know, I can't speak for others about this. That's terrible. That's, that's the opposite of trying to make a difference, right? So it was important to me that this piece be collaborative, that it isn't just me writing, I don't know, 35 or 45 minutes or what have you of conflict and chaos for the sake of just saying how bad we are as a society right now, how much we're fighting. It was important that this be collaborative because it needed to represent for the jazz combo at least um the six of them coming forth talking about something that they need to talk about that they need to address because it all goes to advocating for you know systemic change for equality for justice for peace and so on and and all these things that you know we need to have so my personal involvement is with the, with the actual musical conflict itself, with with this banter between jazz combo and solo flute and large ensemble and whatnot, that's really it. Um, and I'm, of course, I'm organizing the project and, you know, driving the narrative arc and where it involves Amy's part, she's involved with that too. But when it comes to where the jazz combo members make, you know, create their solo platforms or when Amy does the sound healing session, I'm stepping out of the way. You know, the jazz combo members music, when they have these platforms, it's all improvised solos. It's just, it's just them. And they're constructing this really. It's their own music. And that's, you know, being put in the piece to represent them at their moment. I'm really not writing any music for them. Um, and to that effect, I guess I'm just moving out of the way where absolutely necessary to create space for those who haven't been given space to speak out on these issues and make their voices heard. And I would have to say to that extent, one of my artistic statements for this project is using what I do have, this platform I do have, whatever you want to call it, and the privilege that I absolutely do have to reinforce the importance of speaking out against such inequalities and injustices, to not remain silent on such issues when silence is complicity, to those in the greater community with similar or equal privilege to me who are unaware of or who have also not experienced such disparities and injustices. So I suppose that's really my answer is, you know, my, my focus is on the conflict. My focus is on incorporating the combo and the soul flutus and everything else to reinforce the conflict of the narrative arc of the piece. But everything that's theirs, that they're bringing to this, I'm stepping out of the way entirely. Mm -hmm. I, that's very well said. And I, I think it's kind of neat. Um, you know, you said it, the piece may not address where do we go from here, but I think it's really cool that your creative process is like an example of what, you know, society should be at the end of all of this. You know, the, the fact that you are collaboratively working together, a diverse group of individuals and in creating something great, you know, that's yeah. uh, kind of symbolic in its own right, the way that this is being created. Well, thank you, Jeff. That really does mean a lot to me. I appreciate it. And I have to say, I have been struggling with this since day one, since day one of this project, you know, 
is is this effective? Are we doing this? Am I at least doing my my role in this, my part in this effectively? I've been grappling and struggling with the possibility that I may be speaking for these issues and not stepping out of the way. It's been a massive struggle to, you know, step out of the way completely because it's, you know, it's important that everyone's voices be heard and something like that. You know, the thing with this symphony that I think I felt more recently than anything else is it feels so filmic to me almost. Um, I'm talking about, or at least I have been talking about, you know, the conflicts and narrative arc, and I guess characters, if you want to call it that. We have the character of the traditional band orchestra, the character of the jazz combo, and this and this solo flutist and sound or whatnot. And there, weirdly, there's this story here, start from beginning to end, that moves linearly and. I don't know how this is going to end necessarily just yet, other than there is going to be the sound healing session and it's going to present an idea of how we can start listening to each other again, or at least, the, you know, the quote unquote characters on stage. But, you know, it really feels like, to me at least, that this is in some ways the an imagined film score for a film that doesn't exist necessarily, but it, in a way it kind of does exist because the drama of it is literally the musicians on stage or something like that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it is important that as, as a composer and grappling with all this, that I do step out of the way as much as possible when it is time for say uh, the tenor saxophone to come forward with their platform and just talk about their issue or the drum player or the piano player and so on and so forth. I guess if that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, we just rambling totally does. <laughs> no, 555 somewhere and it's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'm no, just rambling. That's, that's great. And you mentioned earlier about anybody that might want to get involved um, with recording interviews or um, if there's anybody listening that might want to get involved with this project as potentially, you know, uh, performing it or, uh, or as a consortium member or anything like that. Yeah, we do have a consortium for this, for the uh, for the wind ensemble version, at least. And I do want to stress that there is an orchestra version in the works right now. I'm working with conductor Tiago Tiberio on that. But if there are any orchestra directors out there listing this and you want to get involved, just I the information will, will be there somewhere in the description or something like mm-hmm. that. Just contact me. Let's, you know, let's make something happen, you know. Right. Um, Motifsymphony1.com, right? Yeah, that's it. And then the the handle is that too for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but it's one the number, not one spelled out. Gotcha. I'll link all of that in the description for those of you that are interested. Uh, anything else you want to talk about with that project? Um, Other than if you'd like to be interviewed, if you want to talk about the issues that this piece is going to discuss, contact me too. Um, feel free to just send me a message. Or if you go to the website, there is a form, I believe, that you can fill out, you know or something like that. So we, we would love to have you talk about this and we'll include it in the piece. Awesome. If if folks want to get, uh, you know, in touch with you, uh, not necessarily regarding that project, but possibly collaborating or commissioning you in the future, what's the best way to, to do that? Well, I have, I have a website. It is my name, Josh Trent Um, my social media handle is Trent do motif. You can reach me there. Um, my commissions are always open, they're available, and I would love the opportunity to be able to collaborate with you and your students. Awesome. And you know, finally, um, we've been talking a lot about this one project of yours, but is there anything else you're working on right now or any performances coming up that you, you'd like people to know about? Um, unfortunately, no performances that I'm aware of. Oh, up, right. Um, COVID. But, <laughs> COVID. But I did just finish a couple of pieces for adaptable ensemble slash uh, flex band. I know that that's been, there's been a huge push for that recently. Thank you, Creative Repertoire Initiative for, you know, <laughs> right. starting this and providing some really <laughs> valuable resources. So I've just finished a couple of those. Um, I've been thinking about getting back into chamber music once I've gotten past, um, you know, the majority of the work for this symphony. I've been thinking about going back to that. That's something I haven't done for a while, and I think that would be fun. Um, apart from that, just I've really been focusing a lot on my mental health lately and self improvement. And I actually started meditating this year, which 
I guess is why I've been so interested by the sound healing too. That was like another form of meditation for me that just really spoke, really spoke to me or something like that. Um, as far as performances go, like I said, nothing, um, nothing in the pipeline as far as I'm aware. However, um, the chamber group Sparter Box recently gave a couple performances of the piece I wrote for them, All I Wonder. They have a fantastic album of miniatures written for them called Sparter Shrinks the Box. It's on their band camp. You should go, you should go check out the group. Um, it's just um, fantastic people and some fantastic music by some wonderful composers. So that's really been it for me going on. Thank you again so much. Sincerely, it means a lot to me that you took an hour out of your day to, to talk to me for this podcast. Um, hopefully some people besides my mom listen to it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. This is this is absolutely an honor. I'm so, so thrilled that you asked me to be a part of this for your first season. It means a lot to me, especially with everything going on in the world right now and how crazy things have been and whatnot. So thank you for, you know, Thank you for inviting me. It's been great talking with you. My, my pleasure. Hopefully we can do a, a part two after your symphony has premiered and we can we can talk about the impact it's had. Yeah, I that would be wonderful. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'll let you get back to your life. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Really yep. it. We'll see ya. Composer Disclosure is produced by Jeff Herwig and is a product of M&M Music Press, LLC. Music in today's episode includes Freedom by Jeff Herwig, The Great River Rapid Race by Josh Trentadu, Summertime Echoes, Movement 1, Youthful Adventures by Josh Trentadu, Symphony No. 1, Movement 1, Prologue, Early Draft Preview by Josh Trentadu, and Excursions for Tenor Saxophone and Piano by Josh Trentadu. Special thanks to Josh for allowing us to use recordings of his music. Make sure to check out all of the links included in the description from today's episode, and be sure to subscribe to Composer Disclosure, available on your favorite streaming platforms, and please follow us on Facebook and Instagram, at Composer Disclosure.